Okay, listen up. Tonight is the last night of our uh, particular series on how to understand your Bible. Um, the first night we looked at a lot of the motivations for why we should be doing this, and uh, then we got into a little bit of nuts and bolts last week. We got into the, the deep waters of the nuts and bolts, and we're going to kind of stay in the deep end a little bit uh, this evening as well. So I want to jump right in with this, figures of speech. So a figure of speech is a word or phrase that is used to communicate something other than its literal, natural meaning. And we all use expressions like this very frequently. We'll say something along the lines of, that argument doesn't hold water. It's important to recognize those kinds of statements in the Bible. A figure of speech happens all the time in Scripture. Sometimes it doesn't matter if a statement is figurative or literal very much in Scripture, and sometimes it does. Martin Luther and Ulrich Zing, Zing, Zwingli, excuse me, um, they were two leaders of the Reformation, uh, and they were discussing the scriptures and they talked about the communion service, particularly the words of Jesus Christ in the communion service when he said, this is my body. Now the Roman Catholic Church took that phrase as literal, that the, the bread and the wine actually literally became the physical flesh and physical blood of Jesus Christ. The, the, the phrase by that or for that in theological terms, by the way, is transubstantiation. Let's not get too in the weeds on that. But that's what they, they that's what he believed. That's what the Catholic Church believed, I should say. Luther, too, took that to be a very literal thing, that when Jesus said, this is my body, that that's what that meant. It physically was his body that we were partaking in and physically was his blood that we were drinking as well. Zwingli, however, insisted that it is a metaphor, that the bread and the wine represent the blood and the body of Christ, that Christ is present spiritually in communion, but not physically. And these two leaders did not agree on this point, and the Reformation churches actually were split on this particular issue. So whether it is a word, whether it is a phrase, there are times when this can be a very significant question when you're studying scripture. So let's look at figures of comparison. And all of these, by the way, these are figures of speech. So figures of comparison. We'll start off with the first one being a metaphor. A metaphor is an implied rather than actually stated comparison between two things that are basically unalike. So we've already talked about one, Matthew 26, 26. I have that for you right there in the scriptures. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take it, this is my body. Now, that's a metaphor. I was just having a discussion with, uh, with a person about uh, the issue of hell. And uh, this individual believes that hell is not an eternal place. That hell is something that uh, exists, that it will cease at some point. Um, it is not eternal. It is a place of punishment, and there is a certain time that it will end. And the, the theological term, by the way, for this is called annihilationism. They believe that there is a place that you go to to be punished and tormented, but only for a season, and then you're literally, in, in many of their eyes, burnt up. You're just done. You cease to exist. That's it. So it's, it's annihilationism. Now, I do not accept that. I do not believe that. Um, I believe, and he, he bases his belief on a lot of different things, but here's one of the things that he also embraces, um, and that is the idea that the scriptures talk about those who are dead as having fallen asleep. And so, is that a metaphor, or is that a literal statement? Do, when we die, are we in a sleep mode? Because there are many believe, that believe that, the Seventh-day Adventists believe that, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that, that when we die, we go to sleep. Is that a metaphor, or is that a literal statement? So, th that's what I'm talking about. This becomes a very important theological uh, issue. The second uh, figure of comparison is a simile. A simile is a lot like a metaphor. 
except that the comparison is actually expressed using words like or as. So Job 41 verse 24, his heart is as hard as a stone, even as hard as a millstone. There you go. That is a simile. So how do we approach these in Scripture? How do we interpret it when we come to it? Here's the things that I want you to catch as we go through this. Number one, notice whether the point of comparison is mentioned in the verse or in the context in which you are studying. Always remember, by the way, coming back, you see it over and over and over again as we talk about studying Scripture. Context is always primary. If, if it is in there, then take that as the key interpretation. For example, in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 4, the people say to Rehoboam, Your father made our yoke heavy. And we can see from the context in that discussion exactly what it is that they were talking about. It wasn't something that was literal. It was a metaphor. Second point. If the point of comparison is not mentioned, consider the objects being compared and take the natural meaning as the most likely one. I've given you a verse there. You will be like an oak with fading leaves, like a garden without water. Now, a garden without water is what? Dead. <laughs> That's right. That is the only natural meaning of the image that he's trying to portray in Isaiah chapter 1. So number three on the guidelines here, use parallel passages if there are any. Remember that an object may have different meanings in different similes. We need to use care as we go through this. In Matthew chapter 11 verse 29, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. This is obviously a metaphor. But what is the comparison? Well, other usages kind of help us in determining the meaning. Jeremiah 27, verse 8. If, however, any nation or kingdom will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, or bow its neck under his yoke, I will punish that nation with the sword, famine, and plague, declares the Lord, until I destroy it by his hand. So you see that that is something where we are being submissive to. We are, we are literally coming under the uh, reign of somebody else. Well, that's the, the whole point of the metaphor that Jesus used. And you can see that as comparing that to Jeremiah 27. So let's move on to another figure of speech, a figure of relation. This is where a word is substituted for another word which is related to it. A is mentioned, but B is meant. <laughs> and this gets really confusing. So, met metonymy is the first one. Metonymy is a figure of speech in which an idea is evoked or named by means of a term designated some associated notion. Like I said, this is getting deep, guys. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. Even to this day, when Moses is read, Moses is mentioned to represent his writings. Does that make sense? That's metonymy. Um, in the Gospels, it refers to all of Judea going out. That is a place that is being used to describe its people. Here's another one. Synodiki. Synodiki is a figure of speech by which a more inclusive term is used for a less inclusive term or vice versa. Genesis 42, verse 38b. You will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. Jacob is not saying that only his gray hair is in jeopardy. <laughs> He's saying that his whole body is in jeopardy. So... Let's move on, because I, I think that I don't want you guys to get too bogged down in some of that. I'm just trying to introduce you to the ideas. Other figures of speech. Here's one, and this is not what you would probably think of, an apostrophe. Now, apostrophe in a figure of speech is where uh, <coughs> the writer addresses directly things or persons absent or imaginary. And for the purpose of the moment, he treats things as if they were persons. 
Apostrophe is a dramatic figure of speech that adds life and strength to writing. It is normally quite obvious and almost always not literal. Psalm 68, verse 16. Why gaze in envy, O rugged mountains, at the mountain where God chooses to reign, where the Lord himself will dwell forever? He's making a distinction here about these mountains. One, obviously, or all these others having envy at one particular mountain. That's something that, you know, he's, he's using this just to kind of make a dramatic point. Now, it's kind of like, it almost seems like this next one, personification, but it's different because in this figure of speech, the writer speaks about, but not to, a non-personal or non-living thing as though it were a person. Personification is often combined with apostrophe. Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. We know that days do not talk. But the psalmist is using personification to tell us that nature reveals the work of God's hands. This is a common uh, writing method, mode, figure of speech that's used even to this day uh, by writers. Um, another writing style, another figure of speech, figure of comparison is this, hyperbole. Hyperbole is a deliberate exaggeration for emphasis. Both the writer and the reader must recognize it as deliberate. Otherwise, the reader might suspect the author of deceit. So, Psalm 119, verse 36, 136. Streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. Rivers were not flowing from his eyes. He was using this figure of speech to communicate how grieved he was that men were not keeping God's word. By the way, preachers are very good at hyperbole. Um, number four, interrogation. This figure of speech is a special kind of question. It is a query which can have only one answer because that answer is obvious. The writer needs not to give the, the, uh, the answer to the question. Jeremiah 32, 27. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? The obvious answer is nope. So that's interrogation. Another figure of speech, irony. This figure of speech is different from the others for it says the opposite of what it means. It's used for emphasis like hyperbole it must be clear to the hearer, so there is no question of deceit. If irony is spoken, the speaker's tone of voice typically reveals it. So, Since we have written rather than spoken words in the Bible, we can have difficulty at times recognizing where irony is actually employed. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 20 is a perfect example. It says, When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls and of his or slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. She wasn't saying that David was honoring himself, and you can even kind of almost hear her tone in the words that are being employed here. She she felt the exact opposite of what she was saying. So that's irony. Any questions on these figures of speech before we move into the next section? Okay, let's talk about symbols. A symbol is anything that suggests or stands for something other than its ordinary meaning. It may be something natural, like a dove, or something manufactured, like a cross. The Bible uses symbols. They may be natural, or they may be miraculous. They may be things that actually exist or things seen in a vision. They may be objects like a lampstand. They might be actions like eating a roll. They might be ordinances like baptism. They might be materials like white linen. They may be a number 
It might be a color. It might be a name, like Sodom. Maybe a metal, like gold. Jewels, like pearls. Creatures, like a lion. Symbols can be used to reveal truth or hide truth. They hide truth from those who do not understand the symbolic meaning and see only the natural one. The Bible often does not identify its symbols, but leaves it to the readers to recognize them. So, let's start with symbolic numbers. The Bible uses some numbers symbolically. The most prominent number that we see in Scripture from beginning to end is the number seven. No verse says that it is symbolic, but when we study verses in which it is used, we sense an implication beyond its actual literal meaning. The number seven shows up over 600 times in Scripture. And once you begin to study them, you realize that the number carries with it the idea of completion or perfection. And many times that symbolic meaning is not present. So, so context... And every occurrence needs to be studied very carefully. The number three is also a very prominent symbol in Scripture. But it's important to keep in mind to not see extra meaning in a verse um, where, unless there is some indication that there is more to that verse being employed. So let's look at some guidelines for interpretation on this. Uh, number one, study the way the Bible interprets symbols itself. Number two, when studying natural objects, note their natural qualities. I'm behind on that, sorry. And number three, and we keep coming back to this point, study the context. Number four, avoid speculation or arbitrary meanings that come from your own head and not from Scripture. Before I move on past symbolic numbers, I just want to say they are extremely important as we study a book like what? Revelation. It's not revelations, plural. It's revelation. Um, so uh, just kind of remember that because that is one of the most annoying things to me in the world. Uh, but uh, when it comes to numbers, you need to understand their symbolic uh, importance, particularly when you're looking at the book of Revelation. The reason why is because there are those who would say that certain numbers are literal and certain numbers are symbolic. Jehovah Witnesses take the number 100,000, which is seen in the book of Revelation, and they take that as a literal number. Why do they do that? When they also take other passages of Scripture in the book of Revelation to be very symbolic. So it's, it's one of those things. We, we have to be able to understand where a uh, numeric symbol is being employed and how it's being employed and use those guidelines for interpretation. Let's move on to something that uh, I think is going to be new to a number of you, but that is types. Types. Types are an important and rather complicated area of biblical interpretation. Types beautifully bring out aspects of Scripture's truth that are, are very valuable for us to know. Types are of various kinds. Persons like Adam, Moses, Elijah, Melchizedek. Events like the lifting up of the bronze serpent or the flood. Objects like the altar of sacrifice or the lamb. Institutions, like Passover. Places, like Canaan or Jerusalem. Even religious offices, like prophet or priest. So, let's, uh, let's talk about this. The type is divinely purposed. There must be evidence in Scripture that God has indicated the correspondence between the type and its fulfillment. Where the New Testament speaks of a parallel, there can be absolutely no doubt. If the New Testament makes no mention of it, then we need to be very careful as we try to determine whether or not it is a type. So number two, the type is in the Old Testament, and the fulfillment, which is called the anti-type, is in the New. This makes a type distinct from other figures of speech 
like parables or symbols. Third, the type is a shadow. It may be physically real as the tabernacle was. Nevertheless, it is still only a shadow when compared with the spiritual reality that fulfills it. A picture of a tree is real on paper, but it is still only a shadow of a real tree. So, guidelines for interpretation when it comes to biblical types. Number one, with the exception of a few visions, the types are actual things in history, and the anti-types usually have an historical basis as well. The Passover in Israel's history pointed forward to the historical death of Jesus Christ. Second, Types are physical pictures prefiguring spiritual realities. John chapter 3. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. That is a type. Now this whole, this, this is a, a, a theological principle, a theological term that I'm kind of giving to you, but it is an important way to study Scripture. When you see a type in Scripture, and you can see it's, uh, it's introduced in the Old Testament, it's really fulfilled, it's rich meaning is brought out in the New Testament. That's what we're talking about. So you have this historical event where, um, do you remember what happened when the Israelites were being bit by all of these poisonous snakes and all of a sudden Moses is given the instructions to craft together a bronze serpent that they lifted up on top of a pole and all the people had to do was look at that and they would not die from these poisonous snakes it's it's an Old Testament event it really happened and when that snake that bronze serpent was lifted up onto that pole that was where they had to have their faith, that if I look at this, I will, I will not die, even though I've been bit by a poisonous snake. Well, you go all the way now to the New Testament, and Jesus himself is likening that to what's going to happen to him. When he is lifted up on the cross, all men are going to have to do is look to him on the cross and have faith that if I, if I can trust in him, I won't die, ever. And so that's the rich spiritual fulfillment of that actual historical event that occurred. And that's, that's a pretty nifty thing. That's a, a type. So third, let's move to the next point on this. The fulfillment is on a higher level. And I've already, been, I've already been kind of introducing that to you than the type itself. So look at John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How much greater is the Lamb of God than a simple farm animal? That's the point. Number four, there is a central point of comparison. And number five on types, the spiritual fulfillment grows out of the natural meaning of the type. Just like we looked at in John 1, 29. He is the Lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the world. He's, he's the ultimate sacrifice. These lambs were sacrificed over and over again in the Old Testament. He is the fulfillment. And it's growing right out. It's connected to the actual thing that happened. Um, whenever that was in the Old Testament where it began. Where we begin to see that type born. So let's move on beyond that, unless you have any questions about types. All right, parables and allegories. A parable is usually described as a story told with the purpose of giving some moral or spiritual truth. It is true to life, but not necessarily an actual occurrence. Someone referred to parables as earthly stories with heavenly meanings. A lot of times in the Gospels, Jesus begins parables with these words. The kingdom of heaven is like, and then he goes and tells a story. There are some parables in the Old Testament, um, but mainly they are found in the first three Gospels. John's Gospel doesn't have any parables, but John does give some allegories 
parables typically have three elements, the setting, the story, the application. So guidelines for interpretation on parables. Number one, think first of the story's natural meaning. The spiritual lesson must be based out of that. Second, Note the occasion of the parable if the occasion is given. For example, in Luke chapter 7, verses 41 through 43, we see that Jesus was in the house of a Pharisee when he shared a parable. That actually gives you a clue as to the point of the parable that he's giving. So, number three, find the main teaching. Find the central point. This is from either the application that Jesus makes from the story himself, or you can see the parable just plainly and clearly. Number four, check the meaning with the direct teaching of Scripture. Since parables are figurative language, we do not use them to establish teaching or doctrine. They, they confirm and strengthen the truth that is given elsewhere in Scripture. And number five, if there is any or if there are any problems in understanding the story, get what light you can from the cultural and historical background. So, those are parables. Now, I want to give you an example, and I, I don't have this written down on, uh, on our scripture, but I want to go uh, and look this up if you, uh, if you want to come with me on this. In, in, uh, in your Bible, Luke chapter 16. Let's go there real quick. So, Jesus has been telling parables, and we come to Luke 16 uh, and verse 19. And let me, let me share this with you. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, Send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone goes from the dead to them, they will repent, he said to him. If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. So... The reason I'm sharing that story is there is great debate about whether or not that is actually a parable. Contextually, as you study Luke 16, it's in the midst of a number of parables that Jesus tells. Some would say it is. Some would say, no, he's actually trying to convey deep spiritual truth, for one, about how we treat people here on earth. And then some would kind of try to extrapolate from that also what happens after we die. I don't believe that's necessarily the point of Jesus' story. I think the point of his story in that is how we treat people here on earth actually has a correlation to what happens after we die. But um, uh, I, uh, I just, I'm just pointing that story out to you. I'm letting you know. There are many who wonder, is that a parable or is it not? There's just great scholarly debate on that particular point. So let's move on to the next thing, out of parables and into allegories. An allegory is very similar to a parable. Allegories have been called an extended metaphor. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. You are the branches. The basic interpretation can typically be found right within the allegory itself. 
So, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser, and you are the branches. And we can see that we are all supposed to be connected to the vine. A branch that's disconnected from the vine is not connected to the true vine. So, there you go. And by the way, it would be dead. Um, so, let's move on beyond parables and allegories now to Hebrew idioms. An idiom is an expression peculiar to one particular language. Each language has different ways of saying things. Idioms reveal thought patterns of the people who actually speak the language. In Hindi, people say this, this phrase. It's the difference between 20 and 21. And that actually means scarcely any difference at all. That's what they're trying to say. So it, it is really equivalent to a phrase that we have in English where we would hear, have you ever heard this phrase? Six of one and half a dozen of the other. You ever heard somebody say that? Okay. Scarcely any difference at all. And in, in Hindi, that same phrase is the phrase, it's the difference between 20 and 21. That's it. Six and one half dozen than the other. So we have these kinds of things. We have these idioms. And the Hebrew had their own kind of idioms. And we need to be able to recognize a Hebraic idiom. So let's look at some of them. Number one, anthro <laughs> anthropomorphism. <laughs> anthropomorphism, literally, it means, literally, the word means from man's form. It is speaking about God as though he has a body, even though he doesn't. Now we have picked up these same kind of idioms in our own language. So we pray things like this. We'll say something, Lord, keep your hand over my loved one. We don't realize that we're using an anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism is really metaphor, but it's a very special metaphor. It's very prominent in the Bible. The arm of the Lord, the eye of the Lord. These are things that are anthropomorphisms. Okay, does that make sense? We're, we're, we're using a, a form of man to describe God. That's, that's what it is. So let's move beyond that now into Hebrew poetry. Poetry is a means of expressing some of the deepest and highest thoughts and feelings of the human heart. We, we recognize poetry, but poetry, frankly, is very hard to define. So let's look at some of the features of poetry. One of them is parallelism. The main feature of Hebrew poetry is a rhythm of thought called parallelism. This means that the poetry is written in couplets, two lines that are related to each other in some kind of way. And the relation of the two lines to each other is not always the same. There are lots of different kinds of parallelism. So let's look at some different kinds of parallelism. Number one, or A, repetition. Two lines express the same thought in different words. So Isaiah 1, 3, the latter part, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. It's saying the same thing. It's repeating itself, but it's a couplet. Here's another one. Contrast. Two lines express contrasting or contradictory thoughts. Proverbs 15, verse 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. That's a couplet. Contrast. Another parallelism. Addition. In this second line, in, in this form, uh, the second line adds a, a complementary thought to the first line. So Psalm 910. Those who know your name will trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. It complements the first part of the couplet. Expansion. The second line repeats part of the first, but it adds something new. It adds something fresh. Psalm 34, verse 4. I sought the Lord, and He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. That's expanding on that first part of the couplet. 
And then transformation. One line is literal, but the other line is figurative. Psalm 42, verse 1. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. One line is literal, the other is figurative. So how do we interpret that? Well, you need to analyze first the lines of each couplet to see how they are related to each other. You need to look for figures of speech within the couplets. And you need to consider all extreme, harsh, or violent language in light of the fact that poetry uses such language, but prose does not. Sometimes when you read through the poetic books in the Old Testament, some very hard things are said. But you won't see that in other parts of Scripture. Now, in terms of the outline that I've given to you, this is, this is all I have laid out to cover. But I, I want to just mention a few other things. There are different kinds of Scriptures or, or different kinds of, uh, of uh, genres of Scripture that that I haven't even addressed at all. Prophecy is one of them. Prophecy is a, is a unique form of, of, of writing where, in, in particular, in our uh, Bible, there are different kinds of, of prophecy. Sometimes prophecy is foretelling. It is, it is predicting a future event. Sometimes it is forthtelling. It is talking about what is happening right now. And that's it. There, is, there are types of prophecy that it is highly symbolic in nature when you read it. Revelation is an example of that. The book of Daniel is an example of, of that. Um, portions of the book of Ezekiel are, are, are an example of that. The, the style is known as apocalyptic literature. It is using symbolism, heavy symbolism, to communicate current physical or current spiritual truth. So, in, the, in, in, in terms of the book of Revelation itself, uh, I want to give just you know, some examples on, on why it's important to understand this. The, the Apostle John was on an island in the middle of, of uh, surrounded by water, he was in, on an island of Patmos, when he had his visions and when he wrote Revelation and sent it out, to these churches. Now keep in mind he was under guard, under Roman guard, and he was wanting to communicate current spiritual truth about Christians who were being persecuted and killed by the government that was overseeing them. And so he was wanting to talk about the government knowing that his letters would be read. So he wrote in a way that is heavily symbolic so that those who read it understood the meaning, but those who were maybe kind of confiscating and reading his letters to see what he's talking about had no idea. So uh, that, I, I guess, you know, I'm just trying to point out to you, prophecy is, is an important uh, style of genre, or genre of literature that you need to, when you study that, it's different than studying something else. Another thing, and we've been doing this on Sunday mornings in, uh, in worship. I've been studying the book of Colossians. That is a doctrine uh, book that is didactic didactic literature it is teaching literature and so when you study doctrine literature it's different than studying prophetic literature another way to study scripture as well is how does the old testament actually relate to the new testament all of these are important considerations when you study scripture um, we've we've talked about a ton of stuff we've we've talked about all kinds of grammar rules and all kinds of stuff that I've, I think I've introduced you to that you've probably never even heard some of these terms before. But I think it's really important for you to be at least be exposed to it. If you want to get stuff out of God's Word, not every bit of this is probably, I'm going to tell you, important for you when you study. But it's important for you to understand as you go through and want to get more out of God's Word. You do more than just read it and then read it again in another translation. I'm talking about really giving it a go at trying to get meaning out of what God is telling you. It'll help you grow in your faith.